morning, plant buddies. Happy Sunday morning to all of you. And I hope you all are having a good day. So I hope watching this Facebook Live will also give you a good day. So right now we have 44, 46 viewers. So if you can, guys, please do share this live feed so that you know we can get more interactions um, with our viewers. Uh, as you all may know, um, today we are going to talk about agave, and we have no less than um, Kelly Griffin and Arthur Ong, who's going to join us uh, today to discuss about the um, awesome agave. Okay, so before we hit off, I'd just like to um do some shout out to all our plant buddies there so hi jc all the way from aklan good morning Irene luna good morning livia dahan good morning mom jocelyn sabala of greenhouse valenzuela good morning have a blessed sunday to everyone um catherine uh, moleta good morning arjov you're back thank you um, Eileen Asas, Alexa Alani, Eileen, good morning from Rodriguez. So, my neighbor. <laughs> and then uh, Cherry Fruit, Baltazar, Lisa Dahilan, Isai Montores, good morning or good afternoon to you from San Jose, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> California. Jeanette Pajares, good morning, Reese Baltazar. Celeros, Irene, Alona, Net, Robert, Rommel, Jacqueline, Mom Jack, good morning. Mamisha, Irene Del Rosario, all the way from Cagayan de Oro City. And so we now have 82 viewers. Thank you guys for watching. So please uh, continue to share this feed. We are going to start um, right now um, just because we don't want to keep this FB live. <laughs> To dragging, so we'll be with you um, in uh, for um, two hours, so that you know we can uh, maximize the time that we have our panelists on. Rosario, all the way from Bohol. Um, Arnel, literal, Enrico Lanz from Cagayan de Oro. Wow, we have a lot of Cagayan de Oro fans. Huh? Um, Romel Cortez, Maisel Bassi, Alona Marcigan, watching from Batangas. You know, I hope all of you guys are safe and um, we wish you all a blessed Sunday. And without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Sir Edward Bakani. Thank you for <laughs> sorry, Nabitin. Thank you for watching. Um, I would like to introduce to you our panelists. From Dumaguete City, please welcome Sir Arthur Ong. Hi, Sir Arthur. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. <laughs> yes, so Sir Arthur, can you tell us something about yourself? I think this is your first public appearance. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, this is my first public appearance. Then. I just love plants, especially agaves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, how long have you been collecting? Uh, maybe roughly around 18 years. Wow, 18 years. So, guys, for all your, for all your uh, needs, <laughs> big <yet> needs. <laughs> <laughs> Contacts are <or> Arthur. <laughs> and so again, good morning to um so all the way from the Vizcaya, Sir Edward. Thanks for watching. Sanrio from Makati. Um Kate from Davao. Charlita, Cherry Fruit. Um, Mayim Buntag, Sir Art. Mayim Buntag to all our uh, watchers from the Vizcayas region. Um, Charlita, who else? Wilson, thanks for watching. Mom Janet, thank you for watching. From Butuan City, Laddie. Okay, so let's move on to our um, other guests for an almost back-to-back -back episode. 
had him during our um, ALO, amazing ALO discussion. So let's bring back again, give a warm round of likes or hellos to Kelly Griffin. Hi, Kelly. Hello. Hi, guys. Hi. We have your East Coast here too. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Happy school. I hope you find me. <laughs> so how is it how is how is there in California in SoCal? Uh well, it's, it's pretty warm and it's been nice. I mean the plants are liking it. Uh the greenhouse is a little too warm to be comfortable in, but um it's it's been nice. Supposedly this weekend it's gonna be the hottest in the next couple of days, but uh, good, good for growing. <laughs> yeah, our our plants are loving it, but not really us. So <laughs> you guys, so you guys, I, have, you guys have the humidity that just changes everything, though. I mean, it it it, it does. Sure. Yeah, I mean, eighty five degrees with humidity can feel like a thousand degrees. So. <laughs> Correct, especially if you just go out. Uh, when you get back to your house, it feels like very sticky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've experienced that a little bit, but, but I'm kind of right on the edge of, of where the coastal influence starts to give away to the inland. So I've got kind of good balance. I can grow tillandsias here, but I can also grow some pretty nice agaves. Wow, nice. So I think that's very good to hear because, you know, um, we, we have, there's a lot of people who are collecting um, agave uh, here in the Philippines. It's good to hear from you and then also how were able to adapt it into the Philippine weather with um, Sir Arthur Ong there. So, Mom Claire Hernandez from Amazing Allo is saying hi to you, Kelly, and to Bisco. <laughs> so, Mom Claire, you're, you still have pending pictures to share to Kelly about the updates on your Allo hybrids. So, don't forget that. <laughs> okay. So Bring it on. Um, so Kelly, you'll be doing some presentation with us, and then later on, you'll give us a short glimpse of your garden. So I know that we are very excited for that. We can't hear you, unfortunately. Hello? No, we can't. There. I think you. For me now? Yes. Yes. All right. Yeah. If, it, if it goes out, give me the sign because I don't know. Sometimes. It's, 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 <laughs> yes, sir. I just keep on talking, like you know, like we did before, where I'm. Just, <laughs> nobody, nobody's in the live room. Yeah. Um, so do you want me to switch to share, share screen? So let me give you a little background. Um, so I, I've been doing agave since I was a, a little kid. I grew some from seed from uh, New Mexico Cactus Research. And that was Horst Kunzler. He's passed, but um, it was pretty exciting to have that as my starting ground. Um, I, I've been able to talk agaves with a lot of people because I've had, cent you know, it seems like centuries of, of growing them, which is pretty appropriate for growing um, uh, century plants, which are never uh, blooming on a century. I think they should call them decade plants. But uh, in general, in general uh, I've had that input and... So this presentation is an adaption of the one I did for the CSSA, the Texas and Southern Society of America. So if you saw that one, don't be too depressed because about 30% of the photos I've changed out. Um, and I, I never say the same things more than three times. So I, I, there will be some variance there. But uh, in terms of what I, I do is I show a little bit of the hybrids and some of the new things, then show some of the plants in the habitat and talk a little bit about a couple of trips we've made recently. And I said the last trip was in, um, I think May, and then then the COVID really hit hard. I think it was, no, it was it was March, March, and then and then we stopped. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's a trip that we did there, and then a couple other trips combined in there. So just to so talk a little bit about what the agaves look like when you see them in habitat, and then finish out with some selections, which are not hybrids, but rather either a high grading of a species or it's just a, a selection of a, a seed batch. So you go a thousand seed and you pick the best one. And then you move that into a situation where you can propagate it and give it a cultivar name. 
Um, but usually that's reserved for plants that are of significant value. So that's what it is. And uh, are you okay with me sharing screen now? Is that what you want me to do? Yes, sir. We can. Okay. I'm hitting share screen. <laughs> um, let me hit we, that. We, we have Jenna Julia on again. So please, good evening, USA. <laughs> All right, and then I hit, does everybody have that? Yes, sir. Okay, so that might be a tight note. <laughs> um, so in terms of um, agaves, I won't get too much into the taxonomy of them, but stick more into the beauty of them. And mm -hmm. this is on my hillside uh, where I work. So both of these plants are in cultivation. and then. Um, this is what happens when you combine genes. Um, I took one species, uh, Pablo Carrillo, which is, you know, we used to call it Gypsophila, crossed it with Vilmorniana, and I got that. Um, that's a combination of Manfredas with Akahui and uh, a couple other hybrids. Um, and then I'm getting some of the barring and, and the teeth like I did with the aloes. And I did that by using things like Blue Glow in hybrids with other species. Everybody hearing me? Hello? We can hear you. Okay, good. All right, so there's the barring in the teeth and then some more manfredos. Again, these are, these are man-made created things in the garden. Uh, this is a selection of filifera, but a variegate, kind of pretty. A um, little more hybriding, a little more manfredos and hybrids. Of course, what I'm known for is these guys. I won't talk too much about aloes, but diving right in, um, this is in Nevada, and it's one of my all-time favorite sites of agaves, but uh, let's dive into agaves and habitat. So just south of the Texas border um, into south of Laredo is this place called Sierra Lamposos, and it's a wonderful, wonderful location. But I'm telling you, honestly, when you go and find the plants in these locations, it gives you a whole different understanding and a whole different feeling for the plants and what they look like and you know what the experience is where i'm standing is very close to the pro, um, location of this species agave avatifolia as you can see in the upper left hand corner um, this plant has been apparently known for over 100 years because i think um, anna b nichols found it because she referred to it as noga which is the local name for it um, it was found later by Len Lowry in the 1990s and finally described by Greg Starr in around 2002, I believe. But uh, it's, it's a plant that is really, truly a wonderful plant. Here it is in habitat. And then occasionally, oh. occasionally you look out and you find a variegate. Um, this is one that was later given a cultivar name of Orca. Uh, they're still quite expensive, but I would caution you, you don't need to spend a lot of money. Um, they're in tissue culture in at least a couple labs in the U.S., and the prices should be fairly reasonable fairly soon. I would say somewhere around the $20 to $30 range as opposed to the $500 range. Um, but but again, it's it's up to you. If you want to get it sooner, you probably pay more. If you want to be patient, you yeah. Um, so does it, does, it go in, does it go in nature for variegates as well? So they, they are that normal. Was a of it. That was a picture in nature, as is this. These are yeah. both in, in the wild. Um, mm -hmm. So what you can do is take meristematic tissue and, and tissue culture it and you get it to replicate if you do it the right way. And you can create it and still leave it in the habitat. But this variegate is much more subtle of it. And I, I, I like it, but I don't think it's near as attractive as the first one I showed. Also in that habitat is these little owl's eyes. These are uh, Epithelantha micromeris. It grows right with mm -hmm. agave latifolia. And then down at the bottom of the hill, where you were looking down in that valley, grows Astrophytum. If you ever wondered where it grows, uh, it's in the same general area as agave latifolia, only at a much lower elevation. And so okay. we get kind of south of Sierra Lamposos, Lamposos, which is near a little town called Bustamante, and we head towards Monterey. And this is new, the state of Nuevo León in Mexico. And this is Huasteca Canyon. It's like the Mexican Grand Canyon. It's a fantastic place to, to go wow. and explore. But these sharply 
uh, ascending um, spires of, of um, limestone are just fantastic plant habitats. And needless to say, a great plant habitat for a number of agaves that we love. Uh, the things that grow in Huasteca Canyon are agave bracteosa, agave victoria regine, uh, some lophantha forms, uh, striata, mm -hmm. and also um, agave albopilosa. So on this trip, which was fairly recent, we cruised on into um, the Huasteca Canyon, but we were headed towards albopilosa because the people that I was with wanted to see it. And this is what we found. If you notice above, above the track, active, that's the road that we were supposed to take. And as you, see, you can see that most cars would not make that. So um, in terms of you know what our trip is, we got turned around. But on this um, steep um, slope here, this is in front of a dam, and the dam is there to help prevent washouts. So it's kind of interesting that the road to the dam got washed out, but uh, that's what happens. But if you notice those limestone cliffs, those are bracteoses on it and Victoria regines growing on the cliff side. So they're right there. But it wasn't such a bad deal to get this knocked off my list because going into Seattle Pilosa is it takes a couple, two or three hours. And I had been there three or four times before. And so I was like, I don't really need to go there again. But people in the trip wanted to, and now we had a good reason not to. So sorry for them, but not sorry. Uh, here's Alba Pilosa in Habitat. And like I said, it's, it's harder to worry about trying to get to something that's very difficult to get to because the road's gone when you've already been there. But it's a fantastic habitat, and it, it's a really amazing plant. Um, if you notice the plant on the upper of the two Alba Pilosas, it has an inflorescence that is kind of nodding. And it had mm -hmm. seed pods on it. And this plant is really unique in, a, in a, lot of, a lot of ways because it doesn't seem to have a set flowering period. And it also doesn't die when it blooms. Now, when I say that is oh. the growing point monocarps out. In other words, the growing point dies, but it pushes a new, new growing point right near the apex, right near the center. And that new growth point just takes over. So you never get a plant that really dies and the only ones that really do die with alba pilosa are ones that get so big that they fall off the cliff and then they fall down into the forest and they don't get the sun and they die because they rot so mm. it's a really interesting plant on uh, and a bit of an enigma but it has these little tufts of hair and i, I think that what happens with those little tufts of hair is that it, it actually collects atmospheric moisture which the plant is able to channel down to the rosette and help help the plant survive so it's kind mm -hmm. of almost like conophytum or maybe it's Lanzia in that way that it absorbs mm -hmm. more from the atmosphere. And I think that's how it's able to survive on the cliffs. But mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be very difficult to grow. It's just very slow. I mean, we've tissue cultured it and it takes a while. Now, here's one in bloom. And here you can see the nodding inflorescence with the little purple flowers. And that plant is still there. It's still on the cliff and it's still alive. Um, and this was taken, I think, three years ago. So. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what's interesting is that it doesn't go away. And here's a close-up of the leaf tips. And here it is in cultivation. Now, this is a, a plant that was grown from uh, a number of plants that we sowed three seeds in tissue culture, and we ended up getting several, I want to say several thousand plants because of tissue culturing. So this is actually a plant that came through tissue culture by way of seed, uh, seed sowing. Um, I mentioned Victoria Regine. This is your very typical Victoria Regine. But you got to kind of view agave as a complex. A lot of times you'll come with plants that have kind of similar key features, but they're different. And for me, what makes them different species is having a different flower and having a different location. This is mm -hmm. a form of Victoria Regine that grows all the way in the north uh, near Monclava, Monclava in Mexico. And it's just a nice big rosette, you know, two feet across and with nice markings. But it's it's just typical Vic Reg. Now, when I say typical Vic Reg, I think there's four, possibly five species within the Vic Reg complex. And then there's varieties or variation between each one. So this would be also Victoria Regine, but this one is in Wastek Canyon, a little bit to the south. And this is a close-up of the compact form that grows in Coila, 
near Vieska. And to give you an idea how small it is, that, that shows you the comparison. The first one I showed you was about two feet across. This one is not far from maturity, and it's about six inches across. So we often see this one as the form of swobode. You sometimes see people call it swobode. But mm -hmm. to me, it's the compact form. And um, you can't have too many Vic Regis. They're beautiful. Now, this is different slightly in that the, the banding is wider, and the tip is much beefier, and the leaf count is much lower. And this is the one we used to call Ferdinand Regis. But it turns out that uh, Anna B. Nichols, uh, who was into agaves around the turn of the last century, um, she had actually described it in the World's Fair uh, publication that she put out advertising her nursery. And so mm -hmm. rightfully, they ended up naming this plant in her honor uh, as agave Nichols here for Anna B. Nichols. Um, it absolutely is different than Vic Reg. It doesn't grow with Vic Reg. Uh, its flowers are different, and it's always consistently different. It grows on a different substrate. So to me, it's a good species. And like I said, world differences are huge. Uh, geographic location, different. So there you go. But within the context of Nickel CA, this is another one. And this is another comparison. Now, some people say Ferdinand Regis or Nickel CA has the three-pronged um, tooth uh, at the tip, but you can see here's one that doesn't really. There's actually just two prongs and sometimes only one. So it's not a consistent character to point to that leaf morphology and say, this makes it so. So I don't really want to do it. And this bizarre one, this is in Habitat, had almost like a claw-shaped weird tip on the end, but what a nice clone this would be in cultivation. I'd love to see this one get around. And here's the almost woody-like projection almost bordering on the thing that we like with Titanota. It has that kind of uh, wood-like projection at the tip of the leaf. Now, mm -hmm. this is a more newly described one. This is vegging towards Pentia. Now, this is still a Nick, Nick Reg, I'm sorry. Um, so this, this is uh, a Nicosia, I'm sorry, one more time. Here's Pentia. <laughs> now, Pentia has the big wide stripes and a little tiny tip like Vic Reg. So Pentia is another species that occurs way south in Durango. Now, I know when people first see this, and you go, oh, now you're, you're calling a bunch of names and you're, you're splitting all these things up because mm -hmm. they all kind of look alike to most people. There are significant differences with this plant. It grows in a substrate that is uh, these rounded river rock conglomerate and most other uh, Vic Reg complex plants in the limestone. So this one's growing in like riverbed sediment, sedimentary rock. Um, and also this one heavily offset, doesn't have the big black tip, but it does have the wide banding and it's one of the prettiest ones in cultivation. So if you get a chance to get a Pentia, you can look on the internet. Some people are selling them. I know at uh, Altman's we're, we're getting it in production. We're picking the nicest of the nice to propagate. Um, but it's an easy plant to share because it tends to offset and, um, it's easy to grow. And so here's a new one. This one's only been described recently. Um, it's a couple hundred miles away from the other Vic Reg habitats, uh, all the way south in Durango. And here it is again. Notice the wide, wide leaf, uh, wide white stripings without the yeah. black tip at the end of the leaves. Yeah. All right. So sometimes you see other plants. We were looking for agaves and we found this on limestone. This is Aspiclatum strongly lobonum. Um, about the size of a large softball, um, beautiful plant with a fern growing. You think of a dry growing fern would, would be able to pick to grow underneath the cactus in, the, in a limestone, but that's where that fern occurs. Of course, this fern goes completely dormant in, this, in the hottest of the months. Another one from the northern range of agaves growing with zebra is agave pelona. And Jello used the photo that I had taken earlier of this thing, really stressed growing in limestone. But this is Polona. Polona means uh, without hair, like bald. So if you can imagine in your own mind, a uh, filifera with no filiferas, that would be Polona. Uh, the flowers are a little bit different. And other than that, it's pretty easy to grow. This photo has kind of gone viral. A lot of people ended up getting pictures of this, but this is one I took uh, up on the hillside. And this is what it looks like when it's stressed. Yeah. Very nice. 
All right, uh, another typical habitat of agaves, and sometimes you have to be willing to climb cliffs and hills. Um, this is a form of Celsi, um, more or less Celsi albicans, or what we call Midas alb albedior now. And then here's a really boring form of Celsi. So you really have to, or, or Midas, and you really have to decide, well, which ones do I want to collect? This one's deep in, the, in a forested area. Uh, in San Luis Potosi, and the other one was in Hidalgo. Different forms, different collections are different. And then, so you can be aware of that. Here's another form of Celsi or Midas, as we call it now. Um, and this particular one was pretty, typical of the Albicans type form. And I found one really special clone. Look at that one. What do you think of that? Very nice. Wow. Um, so, so it almost has a fimbriate edge, and the fimbriate edge looks leaves an imprint on the previous leaf. But mm -hmm. other than that, it's just a leaf morphology different. It's not a really big deal, um, but it is when it comes to how it looks in your collection. So what a beautiful plant. Nice. This is in the wild. Yeah. Nice. Well, Kelly. Any questions? Sorry, because uh, we were discussing, you were discussing about the leaf and it doesn't really uh, make such a big difference in terms of the naming. We have a question here. Is there any study conducted on their identification on the molecular level to compare those species that are quite similar in morphology? Well, I, I think that that's going to give us more inputs. And I, I, we've had this question a lot and I've, I've reviewed a lot of uh, gen genetic sequencing and studying the plants. What difference is it that you can point to that makes it a different species? That's that's the thing. It's like, you know, if you look at the genes for you and for me, you'll see that the DNA is different. Which one of those genes is going to determine that we're a different species? See, so that's part of the problem with these things that are being broken up by leaf morphology. If there's floral differences that are consistent, that's helpful because usually that causes speciation. If there's floral differences, different time of bloom, uh, separation by distance, like long distances that the pollinators can't cross. In other words, 30 or 40 or 50 miles. So that the pollinator is not going from one plant to the other. Then you start getting a more highly de developed species. But within the context of the plants that are sharing genes all the time, I, I think leaf morphology changes are very interesting. Clearly, I've made a career of it. But in terms of um, of them making it a different species, that's difficult to determine. I think molecular uh, research will give us more tools to help delineate those lines. But there is no clear pathway forward to look at a line and go, that gene tells me it's a different species. See, and that's where the problem is. It, it's, still, it's still not an objective measurement because it requires you to interpret the data. And, and that's where I think a lot of people have the problem. So anyway, back to the story. So on that foggy hill across the way, we're at almost 10,000 feet here. This is a high altitude plant, probably 9,000, was the Celsi. And across the hillside is this one, and it's Agave Montana. Montana. And this is very big, thinking about growing in, in mountains. And when I say very big, there's Ryan standing next to it. You can see how big the inflorescence is. He's, he's about six foot tall, so that gives you an idea of relative size. Um, but on that hill that you can see now in the clearing in the distance, that's where the cells were. And this thing does something interesting. And Brian talked about this earlier today in his talk. Those big steeples that, that kind of cover over the inflorescence like that, I think mm -hmm. are there for um, protecting it from cold. The plant pushes the, the sprout up and it has to protect it from the cold and it makes for it essentially a springtime, and then it opens up. So because the flower is so large and it takes so long to bloom, it has to kind of protect itself. And some of the high altitude, altitude plants tend to do this in flower. They put the big steeples up. So here's Montana, really toothy, big plant, give it some room, doesn't tend to offset, tends to be solitary, and it tends to be whiter than it is tall. But it, it, it does like cooler temperatures and mountain montane environments like an alpine. Uh, up there with some collared lizard. And then, <laughs> interesting, here's Midas Montana. So, you know, when you study these things in the wild, 
you you look at that and go, well, dang, if that, that isn't in between the two species that I just showed you. And so that really nice toothy thing across the way with the Cambrian edge in Montana got together and created a baby, and this is it. So this is what kind of gives you an idea that there's two species that are intermingling here, but when they hybridize, they create something that's like a third entity, if you will. So this flower is not anything like the Montana that I showed you, but it's also not typical of Celsius so, or Midas. But just to give you an idea, the bobbies do grow at high altitudes. Um, one of the localities for um, agave uh, Montana is at 10,000 feet. And I just took a picture of the Garmin to prove it. And this is the locality. Nice. So when this thing blooms out, it explodes in color often. Sometimes not much, but sometimes a lot. And there it is again. You can almost like a, like a Photoshop flower in on it. Right. <laughs> but it really does that. Um, I, I would say, the only thing I would say is that this area in Mexico is not really safe. So I would say if you ever decide you want to stay in Montana, come speak to me because I, I, I can give you some clues on it. This area is a little, a little bit dicey because it's high in the mountains. And I think that they're doing other things up there that they don't really want you to see. So in the wild, you get to see plants that are sometimes out of the norm. This is the same mm. species you're talking about. But this is the variegated one in the wild. All right. So at the end of my program, I show a seedling of the plants that are at this location. But these agaves that occur in this location, this is in Aguas Calientes on the border between Aguas Calientes and Zacatecas. And you have these wonderful blocks. And on the, on the slope, the hillsides, the cliff there, grow Graptopetalum, the Graptopetalum amethystinum. This is very close to the habitat. In fact, it's just down that little ab ab abutment down there. But this was an interesting story. We went there recently to, sh to see the agaves that grow here, and we walked across a, a kind of an open field where, where there was some cattle. Well, on the way back, we, a bull decided that we were a little too close to his harem and decided that we were going to get run off of his property. So, so this one always you remember that you know the trouble you go to get seed you know you don't want to have a bullfight just to get some uh, plants in your collection but this one's certainly worthy. It's about as close as agave has come to uh, what I would say are our feathers in the plant kingdom. Mm -hmm. And this is a form of flipper, if you will. Yeah. So Kelly, what what are those like those white ones? Okay, so what this is, is the edges of the leaf kind of peel off. It's like a cartilage mm -hmm. edge. And as it peels off, it, it, it provides the plant with some measure of, of shade, shade. It, some measure of heat distribution, and also mm -hmm. some similar to the uh, apple pilosa, I think it allows it to collect dew. When the dew comes and hangs on the mm -hmm. cliffs, because it grows right on the edge of the cliff, I think that that allows it to get some extra a surface area to collect dew. So that's my supposition. I can't prove it, but certainly a neat plant. Now in Chihuahua, we went up into a place called Cumbres de Mojaca, and this is a typical perii, northern perii, and it has these wonderful, wonderful artichoke looking plants. Wow. And then this is more like perii truncata. This is the location where it grows. It's a standard juniper forest. This is Peri truncata, but a different form. We're all very familiar with the form that's in the um, cultivation, but in habitat, they're all over the board, truthfully. I mean, here's another form. And this one's more approaching that uh, thing that we think of as uh, the artichoke shape or the Peri truncata that is the Huntington form. Um, but that's it in the wild. And then here's one that's even more closely approaching truncata. Now, Truncata got the name as being cut off. If you can imagine leaves being cut off at the tip or shortened, abbreviated, that's what Truncata is referring to. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's no thorns from um, about maybe half the leaf length to the very mm -hmm. tip. And that's very typical of the forms that we refer to as variety Truncata. Here's another one. But if you ask me what Peri Truncata is, it's not just that one clone, it's all of the things I've shown you. Mm. Even this one. Wow, what is this one? This is Peri Truncata with some variegation. Variety. 
Yeah. Nice. I, I want to get that. Uh, gave, it, gave it a cultivar name, Horizaba. But it's been in my collection, I think, for about 15 years, and I, I've been growing it. Um, we actually have this tea seed at, at uh, Altman's as well. So it, it's growing and just being distributed in the United States. So hopefully you can get it if you don't already have it. Hi, Kelly. I have Hi. a question on that plant. Yeah. What, what's the difference of that plant from the uh, Truncata Lime Strike? Lime Streak? Yeah, lime streak. Sorry. Lime streak is an, uh, arbor uh, an arborant plant that came out of tissue culture, All and right. it's kind of a funky one. It's not this. It's not, in my opinion, it's not as nice, but uh -huh. it's different. So, you know, you got to have one of everything, apparently. Okay. Um, but this is not lime streak. This is more right. um, orizaba ish. Uh, lime streak is an okay plant. This is a really nice yeah. plant. If I were going to grow know. one, one or the other, I would yeah. grow this one. Yeah. And I think Why the lime streak is hard to grow here because it uh, when the rain comes the the, the leaf breaks for the lime yeah. streak. Yeah, you know, it's you, you mentioned that because truncata grows in kind of a pine uh, uh, juniper forest and it, it's quite uh, organic matter and leafy. I wouldn't yeah. think plants there would be very subject to rot, but they might not like the high humidity. So I don't know. Mm. Um, but lime streak is a bit of a weirdo. So <laughs> yeah. so. Yeah. I talked about going to places uh, and doing habitat thing. These are the troubles and trials of going to habitats. And this is a, a beautiful, beautiful place. But this uh, Julia Eder and Jeremy Smith and myself uh, traveled to, um, and I think who else was Nick, maybe? Anyway, um, we traveled to go see Agave Impressa. Now, we'd seen Agave Impressa before, but. Mm -hmm. It occurs over a fairly wide area, and each locality is a little bit different from each other. And I hope they can illustrate that here. But to get to this locality, we had to get on a boat and kind of go over to the locality. And you can see the plants on the uh, on the lower part of the pic picture here, just coming into bloom. And there they are. That's agave impressa, and beautiful habitat. Some interesting things at this locality. Um, but here you can see we're at the boat. And you see the cliff, you can see where the plants grow. So where I was taking the photo previously, the photo before, was up in that little vein of plants where they are. Needless to say, they don't decide to grow on the easy access place. They always are the place where you got to climb and it's scary. <laughs> but there they are. And, and if I'm going to add something fun about it, there's Calanzias on the cliff. So, you know, there's if you, for the people that love bromeliads, you always got to go see where Calanzia that is. So there's mm. reason to go up there and see it. And here it is up close. Oh. In flower. Beautiful. And so then how do you think those pictures, Kelly? What? <laughs> how do you take those pictures? Uh, you climb the cliff and get <laughs> in a position where you can shoot across the cliff and take a picture. And hopefully you <laughs> don't fall because if you do that, the photos don't come back. <laughs> so this was an Aristolochia that was up there. Not very impressive, but weirder than anything I'd seen. Uh, also, Pseudobombax uh, ellipticum was in bloom there. Um, and here is the Impressa. So this is the close-up shot while you had to climb the cliff so you could get a shot. Mm. And then you had to keep looking because there's got to be a prettier one, right? Well, of course yeah. there is. So yes. there's a prettier one. And, and then you have to keep looking, and you find a nice close-up of flowers with the bees. And then you find the prettiest one. Nice. Wow. Yeah. It's like the white one, the white part is painted. Yeah, it's exactly yeah. What you see with uh, Nicolier and with Vic oh, Red, yeah. that same kind of imprinting that it leaves the mark on the leaf where the, the tooth was on the previous one and it right. leaves an imprint. So some agaves just leave an impression. These actually leave a white mark, which is kind of neat. It's, it's a, a neat uh, feature about these plants agave impressa. Mm -hmm. So we always debate when we talk about agave impressive, is it more impressive that we went to go do it or is the plant more impressive? And in this case, I think the plant is more impressive. So we decided that we were going to go to another locality that, that we heard was even nicer than what we just saw there. And so this is just a little share of what you do with inadequate cars when you <laughs> hope that there's a road. <laughs> Oh. Down a river for a while. Oh, 
the nice thing is we made it. Now, what I was going to say is it wasn't clear that that was the road. There was a place where it looked like the logical road went across, and we, we inspected it, and it went like about four feet deep, so that would not have made it. So wow. anyway, I thought I'd share that. But this is the um, uh, second Empress site that we went to, or the third one, rather. But um, a different feel. I don't know if you can tell the rock substrate is different. The plants are yeah. similar. Uh, he's going with Bursera here and with, also with Pseudobombax. But look at these plants. These were the king of impressas. Oh. Um, prettiest plants I've seen. This is in the habitat. And there mm -hmm. they are. In bloom. You can see how much different that looks than the other habitat. And you can see why, as a, a, somebody that's studying a genus of plants, why you'd want to go through the multiple localities so you have a better, more complete picture of what the plants look like. And then just oh, some that's lovely. Stellar, stellar, stellar clones. Mm -hmm. And in this mm -hmm. locality, it wasn't hard to find a pretty one. Most of them were pretty. And at the other one, most of them were average and occasional ones were pretty. So anyway, would have loved to wow. add in my backpack, but it's still on the, on the cliff. Now, I grew some seed from years back, and one of them came up variegated. Well, we successfully tissue cultured it. Now, I will say about this plant, it's not a bad plant, but most impresses are not very impressive when they're young. They don't start getting the white marks until they're about a foot and a half across. So don't give up on your impresses just because they don't look like they have very good white markings. It's one of those plants that you grow and it gets better and better with age. So don't give up on it and don't poo-poo a little one. Now, a little one, if it's toothy, that's special. Even if it doesn't seem to have the white marking, if it's toothy, that's the key. If it's not, it looks nice, but it's different. So I will say that, you know, you, you can find the toothless ones, but they don't leave near the impression. Mm -hmm. so now here we are in Oaxaca, and this is in Oaxaca City. This is the church in Oaxaca City. And those are guianbolas that don't grow anywhere near Oaxaca City. They actually grow to the south of Sierra Guianbola. Uh, and these are just planted in front of the church. It's kind of neat. Um, this is uh, on the road between Kutla and Tuxla. And this is Agave El Nitiana with Jeremy's Bath. And a really nice plant that grows in mostly in rock and very soft leafed in terms of no spines at all to speak of. Little tiny dentate teeth sometimes, not always. Um, but another one we went to, this is the Raging River we had across, and there was no car involved because we couldn't get a car across the road on the other side. And so at a later time, when the water was clearer, you could just easily walk across it. When we did it, it was raging, but you still have to, uh, you know, uh, try to keep your clothes and your shoes dry so that you're not hiking. But when you get to the other side of that river, here's what you see. Now, this is a new species that was described, I think, about maybe maybe a year ago, if that, a little over a year ago. Um, mm -hmm. It's agave gypsicola, and it grows in this wonderful gypsum limestone hillside. Um, and here it is. Now, all the little baby plants, they're not offsets. They're all single seedlings. This thing is generally solitary, and it's a very attractive plant. Here it is. Close. It has those corrugations. Fairly spineless, generally. Mm -hmm. Can have those wonderful corrugations that some agaves get. And I think that mm -hmm. corrugation actually helps support the leaf structure because it, it gives it some rigidity. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here it is in the habitat. Um, and again, the nice thing I could say about it is it's so new that we really don't know what it's going to do. Um, but it's a nice, solitary, fairly uh, user-friendly agave. It, it, it makes a nice statement in a garden without poking the crap out of you. Mm -hmm. So this is an interesting photo. So when we first went to the habitat, you can see everything was lush. Now, the next photograph I'm going to show you was four months after that first photograph from the exact same location after a fire had been through. And what the fire did is it took out all the little plants. So take a good view of what's in this photo. And then look, this is after the fire. So most of, the, most of the big plants will survive. Some of the little plants won't. So the plants are going to do fine with the fire. This is not going to get... Whoa. 
but it is kind of interesting to see what the effect of fire is. And it does certainly, if the fires came every year, I think it would, it would eventually decimate the population, but it mm -hmm. seems to tolerate fire, which bodes well for you planting it around your house, particularly in an area right. where you're subject to wildfires. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's interesting about Gypsicola, I, I got to say, there's Gypsophila, Gypsicola, and now Calciphila, I think. Which to me is it's a kind of a silliness about agaves because a lot of them like to grow on limestone. It's not really that unique a characteristic to grow on gypsum or to grow on limestone. So the naming of plants after that, it's a little bit like naming Haworthia's Alba Flora, because so many of them are, are white flowered. But it mm -hmm. is what it is. I would have gone, we were gonna call this Argentium because it's silver, the plant is so silver. But it turns out it grows over on the other ridge, and on the other ridge where it was described from. The plants are a mix of blue and green. What I would also point out about this picture, if you see the little spindly inflorescence in the background, there's two of them that are kind of looping over. Mm -hmm. That's the flower spike on this enormous plant. So it's like a big flower with a little tiny flower. I mean, a big plant with a little tiny flower. You don't yeah. expect that. You expect, you know, like that one Montana is giving birth to a telephone pole, and here this one gives birth to a little broomstick. So it is kind of funny. It just, I wouldn't be what I would have guessed with it. But happiness abounds. Uh, here is the same locality. You can see a few Gypsicola and Hectias. And this Hectia grew with the Gypsicola. Oh. And then here's more of the Gypsicola. And this one is the Tata population. What's interesting about the Tata population is there were blue ones and green ones. So, again, leaf morphology. Uh, is leaf color alone enough to make it different? No, I don't think so. Is the fact that one has almost no teeth and the other one has a little bigger teeth? I don't really think so. These are just natural variations within agave. And I, I really don't think that, although it's very worthy, I'd like to grow both of those plants. I don't think it's worthy of two names. Uh, for, this is from Caria Purposi growing uh, in Oaxaca. Just threw that in there. Um, south, south of um, where uh, this is in Oaxaca, on the road south towards Oaxaca City on the inland road, we took this turn down to what we would call the Quiquitlan form of Taikota. This, this plant has now been described um, as Agave Kyoto Pekensis. We used to call it uh, the greener form of Titanota. But here it is, and it's toothier, and it's bluer or green. But here it is, and I'll leave it at it is. We, if you want to name it in five different species, you can name it. Um, but here it is in variegate. I, I've been growing it for a long time. This, this one came up in seedlings from about 2002. And um, I think it's a spectacular mediopicta. Unfortunately, it's very slow, and I have to core it to make more of it because it's not too uh, interested in offsetting. But again, what's the interest in that? This is the Laowai form of uh, Titanota or Kyoto Pekensis. And this is the one at Rancho, um, not Rancho Tambor, this is at uh, Tepetazonga. Mm -hmm. And then here's the variegated white ice. And then here's black and blue, sometimes known as blue ball. Blue ball. Right, right Arthur? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then here's one that's very shark like. Hey, um, Kelly, you have a story about blue ball. What do you want to know about it? <laughs> how it it's come about? It, what, what's the similar name of it? <laughs> I'll go back one. Yeah. Um, okay. So what happened was uh, I, I named it black and blue because I thought it was kind of a cool name. But when yeah. we started tissue culturing at a different lab, we didn't want to step on anybody's toes. So we named it blue ball. So one lab was selling it as blue ball and one was selling it as black and blue. I think black and blue is a better name and it's the one that stuck, but it's essentially two names for the same plant. I, I know that that's un inconvenient and that's one of the reasons why we, we, we uh, you know, ditched the blue ball name because black and blue was the original name that I had named it. And mm -hmm. I wanted to get away from the habit of what, what a lot of the companies in the States seem to do is, give multiple names to stuff so that they can sell more products. So I, I kind of want to stay with it and be consistent. And so I, I call this black and blue, but 
but they're the same. If you have both, then you have two plants of the same thing with two different names. And it's a cool plant. So this is a habitat shot in Tepe de Zonga. This is a couple of miles away from Rancho Tambor. Um, but uh, these plants are so variable. You could have a whole collection on just the Titanota complex and, and be very happy. I mean, you'd really have a myriad of plants in your collection, as you probably know. Same thing. This is one of the forms that was more typical of the ones at Tam Tambor. Uh, this one is more typical of the Tepe de Zonga ones. This, this is not my plant, but a really beautiful plant. And if you notice, it, it looks for all intents and purposes like an Otero eye, but blue. So I, I don't know if that shoots it down for anybody, but some people would suggest it's a hybrid. This was collected in seed in the wild. And then here's the one from the Rio Hondo area down near the bridge. And then here's one from Santa Lucia. So then just all, all different forms and variations. This is also Santa Lucia. And I noticed that this plant looks a lot like the first one I showed you at Tepe de Zonga. So there are on either side of Rancho Tambor. And again, they're quite variable in habitat. And um, again, if you want to divide them by leaf morphology, I suppose it can be done. This is uh, a habitat shot of a really toothy green one uh, mm. at, at the uh, the lower bridge site. So the leaves are really curling inside. Yeah, this was very dry season. You can see all the dead leaves in there. and It's really trying to protect itself. I mean, essentially, that's right. what it is. It's a little down low dryer plant. And then here's mm. one that came up from seed, and it looks like those little tiny mini ones, but blue. Mm -hmm. Now... There's a lot of stuff going around as Potatorum. Potatorum generally is a solitary good-sized plant. It's the one we call the butterfly agave. This plant is pictured in habitat in Oaxaca on the road to Dayun Califanoi. Um, this plant is about two and a half feet across in diameter and non-offsetting. Typically, Potatorum is non-offsetting, solitary, and that's how you can tell it from Ismensis. If it's about a foot across and it's got babies all around it, it's Ismensis, most likely. Could be Navitas, but probably Ismensis. Um, also up on that same road, uh, this is Tillandsia californoi <laughs> and Bocarnia gracilis. Oh, nice. And this is not that dramatic of a picture, other than... You asked me about variegates a little bit earlier about you see them in the wild. Well, this is agave mm -hmm. ferox, and that's a variegate in the wild. So, yes, they occur in the wild. They sometimes have a harder time because they get picked on a little more. They can get burned a little bit easier. Uh, the bugs seem to eat them a little more. I don't know. Maybe they see them. But that's it in the wild. Yeah. And then this plant is another one of those coming out of Latea. This is a, a plant that's not quite nota but sure as heck looks kind of like it. If anything to me, it looks like an intermediate between what we would call uh, Horda and Titanota. And interestingly enough, it's further south than Horda and it's a little bit east of where uh, typical Titanota grows. But it, it is what it is. The plants had no label when we were there. So we just went mm -hmm. with, oh, that's kind of interesting. And there it is up close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was a small plant. I mean, a full-size one of these you could probably grow in a, an 8 or 10-inch pot. Now, this is one we've been calling Purposorum. Purposorum doesn't fit well in Gisbrechti. And this is an exceptional clone after I had my sprinkler running. So I, it's a little bit of a, you know, truth in advertising here. The spines get wet and they turn brown. So that's one thing. But how it doesn't fit Gisbrechti is it doesn't have the pale mid-stripe that you typically find in Gisbrechti. And it doesn't offset by rhizomes. It's generally solitary. Again, it's another one of those that you could describe as a species. Um, if, if you call it Purposorum, Purposorum got sunk under Gisbrechti. So I don't know. And then another new one is just new to cultivation. This is high in the Oaxacan Mountains. This is uh, a discovery that a friend of mine, Solomon, found. And it's been going by Agave Magnifica. And I think uh, rare palm seed had seed of it available. What's most significant about it, besides the fact that the agave might seems to like it a lot, um, is that it has the gray on the outside of the leaves and it has the yeah. on the inside. Mm. So, so that's kind of a unique characteristic. I haven't grown it long enough to know if it's a worthy plant, but it sure looks interesting, and I, I think it's going to 
have some kind of uh, application either in hybridizing or maybe if we select a really superior clone, we'll be able to do something with it. But it's kind of striking. Uh, Agave magnifica. Mm. Another beautiful habitat. If that doesn't make you want to go looking for plants, I don't know what would. Um, habitats are fantastic. And they're not like some little flat desert with, with just a sombrero and a you know, there's all kinds of neat things all over Mexico and all over America. All right, now we took a trip to um, Chiapas not, not that long ago, and we found this plant, and it looks a little bit like Neo-Mexicana, but the interesting thing about Jaime Flora is that the inflorescence on it is way different than any other, other agave. And I've grown it for a while, had it for about 20 years in my collection, but this was the first time seeing it in habitat, and so I was very excited. Now, this is an exceptional clone. It's not necessarily typical, but it's not atypical either of the plants. But here's the flowers. Um, oh, different like stages of development. The flower is very bizarre. It almost looks like a mm -hmm. transformer kind of thing. Um, yeah. like, I don't know what's going on here, but something's going to happen. Um, so interestingly enough, this is my Jaime flora in, in cultivation. There it is, pushing bloom. And there it is, blooming. So... Um, mm -hmm. It's now bloomed out, and it is very cool. So it, it's nice to see that the flower matched what I thought it was, you know, going to do. Another colored lizard. Um, I think this is Cupriata. This is in Guerrero. Um, I, I had reason for pause because I watched Brian's talk earlier today, and he was talking about agave inequities. But this is after I looked up the post in the leaves. This is Cupriata because it doesn't have unequal teeth. It has just these big teeth that are coppery brown, which is what Cupriata means. But uh, these plants are pretty stellar. The only thing that I found is that I planted some on my hill, and the rabbits and the squirrels love them. So it's <laughs> that I, you need to protect it. But here you go, agave Cupriata. Wow. The Cupriata means copper. So copper spine, yeah. mm -hmm. beautiful grain with the bumpy leaves. Again, I've taken pictures of some really exceptional plants, and this is in the complex of what Cupriata is, but this is just one clone. Right. Um, a relatively new described one is Cremnophyla. Uh, Greg described this, I think, about two years ago, maybe? Maybe two years ago or a year ago. Um, but we've had this for a while in our collections, and Cremnophyla means cliff lover. Not a bad name for the plant. Um, there are some issues uh, with the description of the flowers having red um, speckles on the back of the, the, the flowers, which mine didn't have. So I don't know if that would be a key that I would follow too closely, but it is a neat little plant and it definitely is a new species. So um, the other thing that's interesting about this plant, there it is, the green flowers. And there you can see mm -hmm. it. there's no red speckling on mine, but here is the same plant. This flowered in 2016. This is 2019. And you can see the main stem has died out and there are now multiple heads. So yeah. it did kind of a similar thing that Alba Pilosa did. It continues to grow. And so it's nice for those people to go, I hate little agaves that just bloom out and die and I, I have nothing. This one just keeps going like the Energizer Bunny. And then now you can divide it into five and keep one and share it with four of your friends. So you have that going for it. This is an arborant form of uh, agave colorata. Typically colorata is a little smaller than this and has more yeah. spatulate leaves. But if you also notice this one has nearly no spines, it just has these weird margins on it. But other than yeah. that, it was growing with colorata and no other hybrid around. So um, I just think it's a weirdo and we love weirdos. Uh, this is the Island in Baja, and we went there. I could do a whole talk on it, but this kind of gives you some landscape shots of what it looks like to be on top of Cedros. Lots of agave mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Back one. Uh, there's oh, nice. Sebastiana. Sebastiana to me looks like a shaw eye, but blue. And, and I say that what's nice about Sebastiana too is it doesn't rot as easy as I does for most people. So it's a little more durable plant. And then here it is in flower and habitat. Right. Agave Sebastiana. Yeah. All right. So we went out to Margarita Island to go see um, Agave Margarita. 
there is Margarita where, where the island is labeled, and you had to take a little ponga to get out there. We took the ponga out there and hiked <sighs> around on the islands. And the islands are pretty barren. There's some neat things there. Um, in the northern part of the island, on Mary Island, they're green, and here are the plants. They max out at about a foot across, maybe a foot to five inches, maybe something like that, a foot and a half. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of those smaller ones. But what is most interesting to me is the, the variation in this plant. And it's quite stunning when you really study it. You tend to get to know plants by one or two clones that end up in cultivation. I thought this looked very shy, look, but very small. I mean, this thing has a size of a softball. So if you can imagine a small shy, and here's one with no spine. Now, if you showed those wow. three plants to most agave specialists, they look and go, huh, I don't know which is which. But I'm just trying to expand your mind in terms of what leaf var uh, variations there are within the complex. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got a cat. I'm not the only one. Bisco. Bisco. <laughs> Somebody on the on the list. <laughs> hey, I, don't have, I don't have a cat here. <laughs> <laughs> That's my cat. <laughs> okay. All right. So thing with this, if, if you can imagine the plants I've shown you thus far, they're all the same species. Now, I, I guess you could give room for describing multiple species, but they're all on the same island, and they're all likely to cross-pollinate a little bit, so it's hard. But here's another one that we found, and it's stunning. It's hard to believe that all those plants are the same, but that's the degree with leaf uh, variation there is in agave. So if you were to say to me before, uh, are you interested in agave margarita, I would say yes, depending on the clone. If you can imagine these variegated, you'd have even another level of fun. So, I mean, wow. that is a stunning clone. And the full size of that Very is about, nice. about the size of a large basketball, maybe a, a small beach ball. And mm -hmm. here's one that we found that I thought was very reminiscent of Perry Eye. Now, keep in mind, we're all in the same locality still. I'm not more than maybe 40 feet from that previous plant. So mm -hmm. um, in terms of are they different clones? Yes. Are they different species? Probably not. So look at the teeth on that. It's just yeah. so hmm. well, If you don't grow this plant, you probably should consider growing more of it. And certainly growing it from seed would be the best way to approach it. So here's the first clone. And there, there's the second clone. So look at that one really close. And imagine nice. that and that being the same species. Interesting. <laughs> now. We go up the road a little ways in Baja, and you have shy. Now, shies are much bigger and sometimes much more toothy, but they can be small. The ones that call it at Mesa max out at about the size of a large beach ball. But some of the shies that we see, of course, if you go to the Gold Money on the form, they'll fill a small VW, so I mean, in terms of size. Mm -hmm. um, also in Baja is what Gentry used to call Higantensis. This has been now referred to as a form of sobria. I still call it Higantensis because it fits for me and Gentry had a picture of it and it was this plant. So I'm not going to argue too much on it, but this doesn't look like any sobria I know. And it grew right with that plant, which doesn't look like sobria to me. So um, don't want to get into the, the, the uh, taxonomy too much, but this also grew on the Herald. This is the reward of hiking further than other people do. Um, what a beautiful clone that one was. It, yeah. it all Hylanacantha-ish, but this is Higantensis, or in the Sierra Higanta, Sobria affinity. But it, to me, it's Higantensis. Um, and then down the road is Sobria fraulensis. Now, this oh. is at Fridays, and on the eastern side of uh, um, um, Baja, in the southern portion, uh, just yeah, up the road from San Jose del Cabo. So, what? Kelly, those white cover, are those farinas too? What was the question? Um, the, the white cover that you that, that plant has, um, is it the same as the farinas you find in succulents? Okay, yeah. And if you notice, if you notice on the previous one, the banding that you see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian mentioned this briefly in his talk 
about not knowing what the banding is. The banding has a lot to do with rainfall, and it has a lot to do with how uh, water soluble the wax is that the leaves exude. So in very mm -hmm. sunny locations, these plants exude wax to protect the leaves. But during the, the winter and the monsoonal periods, when they get water in the monsoon or when they get water in their rainy period, the water settles in that little cup. And as it settles in the cup, it dissolves the wax and washes it away essentially. And as the leaf pushes out and the sun shines on it, it develops wax in other areas. So you have the waxy, waxy, and then not so waxy, and then waxy, waxy, waxy. It has right. more to do with how water soluble the wax is, how much wax it produces, and how much rainfall it experiences. Now this right. plant you see has less banding, but if you also notice this plant's tilted to the side, so any mm -hmm. water that falls on it drips right out of it. So you don't get right. the banding as, as much. And it's very waxy. This was an exceptional clone of uh, Sobria frialensis. Oh. And there's the flower. Not yeah. a very spectacular flower, but cute. And it's 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 a, a yard size manageable plant. Uh, now yeah. flipping gears entirely, this is all the way to the northern north north coast of, of, of where Agave is. This is all the way in Nevada probably two thirds north in the state. So this is about the northernmost agave that I found. And this is a form of the Borospina uh, up in Northern uh, Nevada. But Utahensis is very um, variable too. Here's one with no spines on the sides. Here's one with quite a few. This is more typical of the Nev Nevadensis form. Although this picture was taken in California. So not so sure Utah and spreading evidences makes a lot of sense for a plant that lives naturally and occurs in California. But again, that's part of the problem with describing this. This is the greener form that occurs in California. And all this population on these brown rocks is green like this. And then this population occurs on gray limestone. I particularly love this clone because on the close up, the side projections look almost like little, little spoons, if you can see the ones on the side, but just mm -hmm. from no side margins at all to these big mammalid edges, and yet they're the same species. So you have tremendous variation within the concept of leaf morphology here. This plant is one of the oh. most exceptional ones I've ever found. This one uh, is a, one of the Nevada forms of Utahensis Iborospina, and it had actually feather-like projections on the side of the leaves. And there's another comparison of one that had these little, I don't know, Pointed shish kebabby things on on the edge, very interesting. But I mean, you can travel with these all day long. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why it's so fun to go hiking for these. It's just photo after photo op of unusual plants if you like them. And so far, everything I've shown you is the same species, different varieties, but same species. Mm -hmm. All right, hybrids and selections just for fun. Uh, this is a form of Celsi. Uh, what we call Celsi Nova, which is a field hybrid of something that's something like a Phototorum crossed with something that's like a Celsi. Uh, Celsi and Midas occur over a huge area, and Phototorum occurs over a huge area, although I will manage to say that I took pictures of both things. So I, I know what the two parents are. I just don't know that it's actually those two. But you see Celsi Nova. This one is the one I call Pikati because it's just the edge of the leaf is variegated and it maintains that. And it's in tissue culture at Altman, so it's a nice landscape plant. The, the only downside of this plant is most Celsi Novas bloom out in about five to six years, but they usually make a pup or two, so you don't lose them. So that's nice. Um, some of the other things I've been doing is trying to get the weird edges that I get on. Uh, some of my hollows onto agaves. Now, I didn't cross wow. the hollows to do this, but I, I liked that. I liked the idea of having toothy edges that weren't projectiles that didn't you know, invade skin and other body parts. I know I need to do something about the terminal tip, but so far, that's kind of pretty anyway. Now, this oh. is actually a selection of mine, and this is a selection of what I would consider Titanota. And if you notice, it has almost no teeth towards the end, very uh, agave perii truncata-ish, but yeah. it's not. It's just mm -hmm. a selection of uh, the Tepidazongo form of uh, Titanota. And then here's a hybrid I made with uh, blue, glow, uh, blue glow with uh, Sobria, uh, sub Cerulata, sub -cerulata. Mm -hmm. And then of course, Manfreda has a lot to bring to the picture of hybridizing. 
these menstruators have these wonderful oh, nice. scents. And now earlier I mentioned the best form that was feathery. This came out of the, you know, I tell you, I was hiking across that that flat area and the bull ran us off. This is a seedling from that trip. So uh, this was the reward for almost getting run over by a bull. And it was kind of interesting when I go back to that, that, that moment. There was three of us, and the bull decided I was the one it wanted to pick the fight with. And it started to charge me, and I raised both my arms, and he stopped. So it does work. I, I don't think I really want to engage a bull, except that I looked around me, and there was nowhere to run. And so I, every time he just charged, I lifted my arms, and he stopped. And I just kept moving laterally to the side and eventually got out of there. But this was my reward. Were you wearing red? Were you wearing uh, so red? This, is blue glow. this one has got the black teeth. It's got macrocantha in it. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting hybrid. More of those flattened edges. Now, this is just a wonderful selection of agave titanota. Oh, uh, nice. Can you guys hear me? Ooh. Yeah, you can. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah, it doesn't look like yes. titanota. I know, but it meant like, uh, that like, it didn't have any marginal so spines, but that, that's yeah. what it, right? Now look at the close up. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. So, so what, I, what I'm hoping I've imparted on you is that the, the, um, the permutations and combinations of these things taken one at a time is just overwhelming. You have all these species variations, and then you can combine species to create hybrids, and then mm -hmm. you can select those things and then recombine them. It just goes on and on and on. And yeah. this is my better yeah. um, Manfredas. This I took today. Wow. So this is in my garden. And it's about, mm -hmm. I want to say, eh, twice my head size. So something like that. One feet? Um, maybe 14 inches, 15 inches. Still feet. Yeah. Somewhere between one and two, like one and a half, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, another hybrid. This is not mine. This is an Akau Akahui hybrid that uh, Jeremy did. Uh, I would just thought the form and the shape of that was just so fine. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure exactly what he crossed, but it's his plant, and I, I respect him. He's a, he's a great hybridizer, and, um, you know, he's created a lot of interesting and nice new plants. And this is certainly one of them. I hope you give me an offset sometime. I'll trade him for something cool. Um, this is a picture of, of my garden, and, I was kind of involved with uh, introducing blue glow. These are snow glows and one sun glow on the end. Uh, actually, two. There's a little one and a bigger one. Um, this is kind of a fun thing because with agaves, this all four of those plants have bloomed out. They all made pups and bulbuls and even hybrids. So I have hybrids created on snow glow, and that will be the next wave. Agaves hybridizing is very slow. Uh, and it should be because yeah. the ones that bloom really quick are not bringing to the table a very good characteristic because if they bloom really quick, they're gone from your garden. The ones that bloom really slow take longer to to get to breed, but it's more worthwhile because they're longer lasting in your garden. And then mm. one of the best agaves ever, and that's my wife, and there's the best agave ever. People always ask me if you want to know, agave utines of Saborospina in Nevada is my favorite plant of all plants of agave. Even though I've gone to most of the habitats of agave, the best one is still in Nevada. Nice. And then we do, let's see, we do. <coughs> Stop sharing and all, th all things are good. All right. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Hope it was a good yeah. one. Yeah, so by the way, Kelly, um, one of our panelists came in late. That's Gucci Romero. Gucci is actually Hi, Gucci. One, one of the uh, pioneers, one of the experts in agave here. In no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has, he has a lot of collection in his rooftop of agave. So there. Okay, yeah, so. Thanks. We do have some questions here, um, Kelly. Um, one of that is in terms of propagation. So in terms of propagating agaves, um, what are the different types of propagating methods that we have? Well, there's not a big mystery with them. Um, obviously, most of them will flower at some point. And mm -hmm. flowering, um, generally, you need two to tango. But if you 
keep the bees off of it and you self pollinate it, you'll get species. I mean, yeah. um, so they, they, they don't have this self incompatibility necessarily, although they're not strongly self fertile generally. You can make those general statements. But generally, if you have one agave blooming in your yard and it doesn't set seed, um, then it probably isn't somewhat self incompatible. Um, on the flip side of that, if you have one bloom in your yard and it sets a bunch of seeds, it might also be because there's one right around the corner or you have another one in your yard that's blooming. Uh, mm -hmm. But those are opportunities to create something new and different. Um, to me, growing from seed is great because if you grow 50 or 100 from seed, you can pick the, the, the nicest of the 100. And that's different than having the one that you have. And typically when you go to a garden center, if you're buying one clone, it might be a really nice clone, but you're buying one clone, so you're seeing one little bit of it. Now, another possibility is, and it's hard for people to do this, is um, to core a plant. Now, some plants naturally offset, like agave uh, um, is mensis. It makes pops, so you just reach underneath and without getting yourself too shish kebab, gently pry the, the pop out and, and then replant it on in pumice initially, and when it's well rooted out, Planted in normal. But in order to do plants like, for instance, Montana or something like an Alba pilosa, and you wanted to make more, you actually go in and surgically remove the center. And I say surgically, you can do it with an, a knife and chop the crap out of it, or you can just excise the center meristem. Either or, you're probably going to get somewhat similar results. But what it does is it manifests by making many pups. And when they get big enough of size, you can very gently with either a screwdriver or a very sharp knife, cut them away and let them heal and dry for a week or so, and then, then go ahead and plant them up. Right. And, and so that's another way. Um, finally, another way to do it is tissue culture. And tissue culture is, is reserved generally for plants that are of, of worth of value because tissue culture is generally a more involved process. It's not difficult to tissue culture something. It's just a more involved process, but certainly if you have a clone that's really special and you want a hundred of them or maybe five hundred of them, uh, doing it by cutting and division it just takes forever, and it's not very reliable. And you get you know first go around maybe five plants, and then the second go around you get twenty five plants. Whereas with tissue culture, in about two years, if you do it right, you can probably have up to. A so that's one of the reasons why we use tissue culture, but. If you imagine tissue culture is just a tool, it's a propagation tool. It allows you to build large scale on something that, that you like. But I, I would also say that um, it has its upsides and its downsides. When you tissue culture something, oftentimes you can get some mutations, and the mutations can be more exciting or less exciting than the original. They can be variegated or they can be monstrous, and sometimes monstrous is good and sometimes it's not. So um, it's all a matter of of what you like, but a lot of the variegates that we get are a, a result of large scale production of tissue culture plants. Because say the variegate only occurs one in a thousand, well, if you grow 2,000 plants, you got two variegates, and then you can start propagating those. So, right. I hope that was a so, long winded answer to kind of, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. If you're going small scale, I would say core the plant. If you're going large scale tissue culture and, uh, yeah. So does does it also does it also grow if you like peel off a leaf from leaf? No. Um, I've seen people root out leaves before. Usually, there's some part of the stem attached to that. Yeah. It's not a very reliable way to do it. Um, Correct. You're, you're better to like if you really want to take a sawzall and cut a plant in half and lay it, you know, where its roots still have some nutrient ability. It'll end up pupping one side or the other or both. Um, that's a better way to do it than to try to individually root the leaves. I, I've seen people root leaves. I've also seen people root aloe leaves. I, it's not a reliable yeah. way to produce plants. Okay. Cool. And then um, when we were talking about hybrids, uh, um, I mean species in their natural habitat, have you also seen natural hybrid um, in their natural habitat? I think you can answer that one. I, sh I showed a picture of one. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Quite often, if if you have two plants that occur in the wild and bloom at the same time, and somehow share some kind of pollinator, 
you'll often see hybrids. We went to a, a locality of a relatively new agave, agave monotlanacola, and it, it it is a very stingy flower. I would say that thing flowers once in 30 years, maybe. And mm -hmm. so when it flowers, oftentimes it can't find a friend. And so mm -hmm. it, it there were a number of hybrids there that were clearly hybrids with something that looked very much like Midas or Celsi. And that was in Colima, Mexico. So yeah, I've seen very, very demonstrative cases of, of plants hybridizing um, and crossing up. Correct. Okay. And then we also have a question here. Are those, are this, most of this agave species will be available at Atman? Um, I'm trying to push all agaves as much as I can. We have quite a few varieties and hopefully we'll have more and more as time goes on. Um, that's the idea. Um, okay. and, and certainly the rarer ones, we'll try to make less rare so that everybody can enjoy them. If it's a nice plant, I mean, there's no reason we can't all have it in our garden at some point. Agree. <laughs> so um, those are the questions that we have uh, from our comment section. So guys, if you have any other questions for Kelly, feel free to uh, put them on the comment section. Um, right now, um, Arthur or Butchie, do you have any questions for Kelly? Yeah. Um, hi, Kelly. I have a question regarding the Tyranora and uh, the FOs. What are the difference? Uh, yeah, what are the difference of those two? Well, I mean, it's it's always a question that people ask you. Yeah, it, it, I it, always saw it's that. It's gone on on, and it, it almost seems like it, it's taken on a personal nature of a of a battle of wills or something. But yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what what it is for me. It's a complex of plants, and yeah. the plants are not they're not. Um, I mean, Brian and I came upon this. Uh, this conundrum of what is this green plant? And we went down and tried to figure it out in 1993, 94, 95, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. And we knew agave titanota because Gentry had described it. And he, he shows a picture of it and he does all these line drawings of toothy ones and of straight leaved ones and of everything in between. Plus he showed a black and white picture of it. And sure enough, uh, in the areas not far from Rancho Tambor, about maybe two and a half miles from Rancho Tambor, is a population of plants that are both blue and green. So they, mm -hmm. there's some of these green ones and there's some of the blue ones together. And then up the hill, they're more blue because they're kind of a more isolated, um, what I wanna say, drier environment, higher on the limestone. But mm -hmm. there are green ones there too. So um, are you looking at plants that are co-occurring? Well. Here's the thing. If it's two species that are co-occurring, I would expect a difference in flowers. And there isn't any. And so that's the problem. And having grown seed from at least five or six localities and seeing what comes out of the plants that I collected seed off of, I don't think it's very clear that you can have a plant come out of a seed pod and say, well, oh, that's a hybrid. Or that's FO76 and the, the blue ones are Titanota. So when they come out of the same seed collection, it's, it's dubious to me. The other thing is that it's very loosely divided. But how it came about is Felipe Otero was hiking in the hills uh, somewhere not far from Rancho Tambor and came back with a plant. And that plant gave those seedlings of those plants were yeah. monikered as FO76, Felipe Otero. Uh, collection number 76. I don't think it relates to the year, but it was probably in the early 80s. But anyway, so that that's where the plant originated in collections. Subsequent to that, um, myself and Jeremy and other people like Brian have made seed collections near the Calapa Bridge. And everybody has said that anything that's green is FO76. And the problem with that is that blue ones come in that same collection. So if they're blue, they can't be one species and green another species when they come from yeah. the same, same source. And the other issue that for me is, is that the pollinators are flying insects. And the, the separation between uh, the Quiquit lawn form and the Tepetazanga form is about 11 miles as a bird flies. And the separation between uh, Tepetazanga and Tambor is about four miles as a bird flies. And the separation between Santa Lucia and Tambor is about two miles as a bird flies. So these are very, very closely from north to south, maybe 
uh, 20 miles and from east to west, maybe 10, something like that. And when you have that kind of close proximity, I don't expect there to be multiple species. I just expect there to be kind of a hybrid swarm of stuff. And interestingly enough, Kerchovi, Kerchovi also occurs in that area, but it maintains a floral difference. And when Kerchovi hybridizes with these other things, you get a floral difference. You'll see a, a floral difference. Um, and clearly, it's not hybridizing with Protocorum, which is also in the area, because Protocorum has a paniculate infl inflorescence with these branched panicles. When you cross a straight inflorescence with a branched panicle inflorescence, you get something that's kind of intermediate. So from the plants that we've grown from hybrid, um, from, from all the, the seeds that have been collected there, the ones that we considered Titanota seem to be in line. Now, when Gentry described Titanota, he said that uh, I found it in a very isolated, dry locality. Uh, I expect that exploration in areas nearby would yield more populations of Titanota. And that's exactly what has happened. Mm -hmm. So the, the concept of what he knew as Titanota was here, and the concept of Titanota of what I think is, is about here. But to me, they're all Titanota. In fact, even in the description of Oteroi, the, th the concept of floral flowers was thrown out the window because there's no floral difference. And he refers to the plants, mm -hmm. or, or the person that wrote up the article, as sister species. I don't know what sister species mean because when sisters are born, they came from the same parents. And with Titanota, that's that's what you get. And you can't arbitrarily, when you grow a seedling batch, go, well, all the green ones are um, all the green ones are uh, one species, and all the blue ones are another species. You you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if I can show you something here. Let's see. Um, let me see how I can do this. Sinners keynote. Um, give me just a second, because this illustrates the point really well. Nope. Yeah. Entertain me with other questions, sir. Yeah, we have. <laughs> so, <laughs> any okay. All right. Um, how can I share screen? Let's see. Share screen. I hear the kitty again. <laughs> yes. I think that's Arthur Scott. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. I gotta get to. Uh, yeah, that's my cat. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sharing screen. Share. All right, hang on just a second. So, can you guys see this picture? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is a picture I took at Huntington. Um, if you read the label, which I can, and if you notice that John Trigger's got them all labeled different clones: clone ten, clone thirty, clone thirty-one. Well. The thing says, from habitat seed collected at Rancho Tambor. Um, do you see the one that's clone number 30? Yeah. It's kind of green, one. right? And yeah. you see all the rest of the... the that's, that's the problem. That's the big conundrum. Now, this isn't something that Kelly generated. This is at the Huntington Botanical Gardens. And this came from a seed. Now, somebody would argue that the green one, oh, it's a hybrid. Okay, well, okay, it's a hybrid, but it came out of seed of the other one. So... One species comes from the other, and that's where I say I have the, the biggest problem with it. So, so, so there's where you go. I, I, I probably know too much because I've been growing agaves for 30 years uh, for nurseries, and I've probably grown 10,000 of them, and that's why I have so many, uh, and I say 10,000 um, tight notas. That's why I have so many. But from what I've seen, you can't look at my collection and go, Oh, well, that one's the green one, so it's FO76 or it's Oteroi, and that one's blue, because they came from the same place, and they can't be one species on the other without something more than that. Now, some people will have you believe that I'm against new species. I, I think they're great. I think it's great to have different cultivars. In fact, you show, I showed you probably about 30 pictures of Utahensis. I think yeah. they're all Utahensis. Not one of them is alike. 
so so I don't have a problem with the concept that the plants, as we know them as species, is somewhere out here. But there's a tendency now to want to say, okay, if they're in this little box, they're here. They're in this little box, they're here. And they're in this little box, they're here. They're here. This is what they are. And so yeah. I'm not an ignorant person. I don't want to like negate the fact that they're different. I just don't believe that the, for my my own purposes that they mm -hmm. they follow what I need for a species. And for me, the biggest thing for species is a clear floral difference and a clear genetic and geographic separation. And neither of those exist with the Oteroi complex, the Oteroi titanota, you know, the Tarkensis complex. But you know what's new? They took uh, Gypsophila and they divided it into four things too. So. It just means you got to memorize more names. But if you look at the gypsophila, look what was done with gypsophila, there's no floral differences. I mean, almost mm -hmm. no floral difference at all between all of the different varieties. So to me, the thing to do would have been to give them all varietal status and call them all gypsophila. But just because you like it that way doesn't mean somebody's not going to write a paper and put their name on it and put it out there and say, I'm the guy. So that's what happened. <laughs> So okay. you have this, the other thing that I would tell people is that you have the choice when somebody prints something to read it, yeah. believe it, and study it, yeah. and then decide to change your label or not. And if you don't want to change your label, you don't have to. And if you do, and that makes you happy, go ahead and change your label. So it really, <laughs> it really doesn't matter. You could call it abracadabra and it'd still be a pretty agave. <laughs> so this <laughs> almost <laughs> I just think, like saying, you know, the one thing that Gentry said in, in all this article is Gentry's kind of used to support this concept of, well, there's not much difference in flowers. He also said, if there's not much difference in flowers, it leaves the taxonomist in an untenable and unsupported position. And that's exactly where we're at with this. If you don't, don't have a floral difference, you don't really have a species, in my opinion. And I think right. that if, if Gentry was alive, he'd be echoing more my statements and less of, Let's split everything into 50,000 different species. But that said, there's been some really good finds of new agaves. Cremnophila is absolutely a new species. That one that um, uh, is now calci calcifila, which I think is, a, again, a limestone name. We don't need any more of them. But that's a good species. I knew that was a good species 20 years ago. And then I asked people, and they go, oh, it's just angustiarum. Angustiarum in southern... Oaxaca, it doesn't make any sense. So mm -hmm. I knew it was a different species, but, and I've been growing it. Nobody cares, but, but you know, th there are good species. Gypsicola absolutely is a new species. Uh, Alba pilosa, a new species. Uh, Ovatifolia is a new species. I have nothing against species that are new that are good. I just am kind of railing against uh, the concept of dicing everything up so I can put my name after it. Um, and so if you want to find a new species, look for some road that just got got made in Mexico or in some little country in, in, in Central America and go up that road, you'll probably find a new species. You just right. don't go to the same species we have and find the minuscule little changes and differences and say, oh, it's a different species. So there, there you go. I mean, if, if you applied the same rules that they did to the Titanota complex to Utahensis, you could easily describe five species. Right. And I, and I think it's a yeah, but yeah, I think you'll never know after after this pandemic. Since the the world rested, the nature rested. You'll never know if you find the new ones. It's going to be interesting to go right. back and to the it's quite, a, quite possible. Some of these areas will recover, and you'll see some species that you hadn't seen before. Um, right. But but I think the biggest key is is to really go do the hiking and the hard work that I was doing right. when I was a little bit younger. Um, I'm still doing it, but they're having to drag the old guy up the hill. So. <laughs> I mean, I still made it. You saw the agave impresses. I was right there next to everybody else. So, <laughs> all right. So we have a question here. Um, agave pintila aurora. Is it available commercially? Uh yeah. Um, it's in production. I mean, we have it in TC. Uh, I think Greg has some, and I have some, and I think you're gonna see it. I think you definitely see it. It, it. To me, it's kind of a weirdo because it's kind of like got that weird. Um, juvenile form of um, Vic Reg, and it seems to be stuck in it. So it grows into a full size plant with that weird marking. Um, it, it's still doing it. it. It's still looking that way as a, a mature plant. 
But yes, it does offset, so it'll be around in cultivation. You just have to be patient. I would say probably within two years, people will be able to buy it. Okay. And cool. it's, another one of, it's another one of those plants that gets better with time. It, it really does. It starts off kind of slow, and you go, ah, oh, it's just a big edge, and then it gets better and better and better. Okay. Cool. So, um, do you have, since you are more of, you know, uh, one of the propagation is through seeds. So, do you have any tips on germination? Um, use fairly fresh, unparasitized seed to start from, start with. Um, you don't want the seed, like, freshly out of the capsule, like the green capsule just split. Uh, yeah. I would age it a little bit because this, what happens is, is the, the seed shell just doesn't crack open and it doesn't germ you don't get great germination so maybe a couple months after um mm -hmm. is ideal um i usually use a, a a soilless mix because i don't like to use uh lots of organics with agaves they typically occur on inorganic substrates like rock or um uh, limestone um, but yeah. if you use a soilless mix and then lay the seed down and then grit i use a uh, granite grit over the top of them and then keep them in a a moist house. Uh, if your humidity is really high, you don't have to keep as much moisture on them. But if your humidity is really low, you have to mist them fairly or water them fairly regularly. You know, at least a couple of, every couple of days. And then mm -hmm. once they germinate, uh, the big key is for me personally is keeping rodents out of there because they'll eat eat up your whole seedling flat. Um, but I, there's ways to do that. You screen them off and keep them out, or set traps, or whatever you prefer to do. Um, and then once they get to the they're past their first seed leaf to where they have two or three little um, regular leaves you can start pl plucking them out and individually potting them i usually wait six or eight months something like that before i do that so they're nice sized plants and easier to handle and then go from there seed on, on agave if it's fresh and not too fresh you do really well if you like seed that's two or three years old it's generally parasitized and a lot of it's died in a little husk and it's gone um, all right okay so this is an interesting question with regards to um getting a new hybrid is it advisable to tissue culture cultivars that possesses good characteristic or is it better to sexually propagate it i think one of the follow-up questions for that as well is um what what's the, what's the chances of getting uh, a better uh hybrid is it through sexual propagation or through tissue culture well, I mean, I would say both. If you look at my, uh, Michelangelo's question, um, mm -hmm. if it's got good genetic characteristics and it's, it's a standalone already, why not propagate it with tissue culture so that more people can have it? But then get it to flower and then produce more plants that are of that ilk. And certainly the concept of both high grading a species, in other words, taking the nicest of the nice and putting them together is one aspect, or taking the nicest plant of one species and crossing it with the nicest of another species, that just makes logical sense. You don't pick the ugliest one in the group to use as your breeding stock. But both are, are applicable. What I generally do is if I have something that's really superior and I only have one, I core it so I have three or four or five. And then when I have three or four or five, then I can grow one or two for later, um, um, production when they, when they when they bloom and hybridizing and then i can try a couple in tissue culture and i can even put one in tissue culture and probably try to force it to bloom so i can get pollen earlier so i mean it, there's techniques i mean i know this sounds like kind of like space science or something but you can force a plant to flower way way before it's time so uh that mm. avoid years years and years and years Right. And actually, um, we got a comment from Chuck, and this is also one of my questions. So sexual propagation is if you want to further adjust it or make a hybrid, PC is more is to make copies of it. So technically, when you do PC culture, it's not hybridizing, but making a copy of the plant. Is that accurate? As a general statement, it's true. It's not all altogether true, because I just told you that you can put something mm -hmm. in PC and force it to bloom. So mm -hmm. there, you're, there you're using TC to um, utilize uh, it to bloom so you can gather the pollen. You take the pollen and put it on a plant. You can avoid mm -hmm. years of, of waiting. The other thing is, is that oftentimes, and some people have done variegates by, by using mutagens to cause variegation. I haven't done a lot of work like that. 
But generally, the nice thing about tissue culturing a nice plant is that if you grow enough of them and, and there's a market for it, there's probably mm-hmm. going to be a variegate of it. So, for mm-hmm. example, black and blue. Um, black and blue mm-hmm. has been grown by the thousands, and people have enjoyed it and grown it. And as a function of that, in tissue culture, we've gotten some variegates, and you now see them on the markets, and people are selling them. And so you not only have a really cool plant, but now you have a variegated really cool plant. So right. tissue culture is, is merely like having a, a really neat pair of, of pruning shears in your, your hip pocket. It allows you to do things with plants that, you know, you wouldn't otherwise do, but, but it's just a method of propagation, and it can be used for other things as well. Right. Okay. So, Sir, Sir Arthur Bucci, do you have any other questions for Kelly? No, Arthur. I have questions. <laughs> I think Arthur is frozen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kelly, I have a question again. <laughs> Regarding uh, mangave yeah. and a regular agave. If you if you're going to have if you're going to hybrid those uh, two kinds of plants, uh, will there still be a spots on the new plant that it will show? Well, I mean, in the, in the future? Um, generally, oh, mangabe. I mean, mangabe mangabe and agave. Agave, mm-hmm. it seems to show incomplete dominance. So generally what you have to do with a like, uh, mangabe cross to an agave is yeah. you pick the purplest ones and you cross it back with the more purple ones in your, in your grex. Um, and you can amplify those characteristics or minimize those characteristics. Yeah. I think it's funny when I see a blue mangave hybrid or a green mangave hybrid because the only point of bringing mangave into it for me is to get purple. I yeah. mean, I, there was one that, again, I, I don't want to slam anyway because Hans, Hans Hansen taught me how to tissue culture and he's a great guy. But when I saw a blue dart, I go, you took macroacantha and made it kind of wimpy and ugly. Yeah. You know, I mean, in terms of what's out there for an agave, which is really tough already, yeah. a, a macrocantha selection is better than blue dart, in my opinion. But mm-hmm. if you're going to cross it with um, mangavi, what you're going to do is narrow the, the frequency of bloom. So it's going to bloom more often. Yeah. It's going to die more often. Correct. And it's, the only thing you're adding to me is purple. So if it doesn't bring purple to the table, I don't know why you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Right. See, I, I, showed you, I showed in my program. The reason I'm kind of looking like I'm, I'm nervous here is I don't think I can show you the yard now because it's suddenly gotten dark. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, did, I did actually go out uh, this afternoon and, and added some of those photos from my yard, so you have a good, good concept of what what I have there. Um, if you cannot get purple from a mangave hybrid, then I don't really think you're you're doing much for it. Mm-hmm. Tequila Sunrise at Altman's in Tissue Culture, and we've got one called Barney, which is a purple dinosaur. And I didn't show it because it's it's being, I think it's going to be patented, but even if it's not, um, it's it's in production and it's going to be available. And it's a nice looking purple agave. It looks very similar to the one I showed, the last one I showed. But again, mm-hmm. if you're mixing mangave and you don't have purple in it, I think you're wasting your time because mangave yeah. is our snail food here. I don't know how, how bad snails or slugs do for you guys, but um, it, it makes the, the plant generally weaker in terms of yeah. long-term. And, and many mangaves, many uh, manfredas when used in the hybrids. Manfredas as a group, there's a bulk of them that tend to go dormant. I mean, completely freaking dormant. They just go uh-huh. away. So if you're breeding mm-hmm. for that, I, I don't know where you're going with something long-term and lasting. And uh, so I've really been really kind of merciless. When I get mangaves and they don't they don't look good or they're floppy leaves, I just throw them away. But but we're doing a real resurgence in mangave, and they've been well marketed. And there's some really nice ones, uh, yeah. particularly the ones with the undulata, undulate leaves, and the uh, um, kind of purples that you get from Gypsophila. I mean, the purpley uh, wavy leaves. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Thank so you. Kelly. You, you you mentioned that, and I was actually trying to interject <laughs> that part of the segment. So uh, will you still be able to show us, or you got the pictures? 
Well, um, I, I, I can try. Let's see. Yes. Do a walk and talk. And this is a <laughs> I'm, all, I'm all wired in here. And so, Sir Arthur, are you back with us? He's losing his signal. Yeah. Hey, nah. Yeah, okay. So far for now, yes. And, and, uh, yeah. Wow. So, uh, it is going to ah. give us a tour. All right, so we're almost at a light, but there's Aurora and a variegated Impressa. Wow. And you can tell it's a variegated Impressa because you can see the little white marks. It also has no spine. And then mm -hmm. there's Aurora. Wow. This then, is the one we posted recently. Yeah. Uh oh, somebody. What did I do here? Yeah. Did I lose signal? Maybe I lost signal. No, uh, we can still hear you. Can you see me though? Yeah. Yes, I can see you. Okay, because uh, I don't see you. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah. here's here's the hill. I don't know. How, can you see it yet? Yeah, we can see. Yeah. It. This is this is where I live. Wow. Yeah, if you see the big plant up on the hill, that's a tinuata with Guiangola. That's what happens when you mix the two. Oh. Okay. Nice. And then this was one I introduced a while ago. This one is um, Moto Sierra, and it has those real strange serrated teeth. Are you seeing that? Yes. Yes. How, how huge is the leaf? How, how wide is that? Is it like a ruler size? <laughs> Does that help at all? Oh, yes. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, huge. This is an experiment here. I, I don't know. This is like bad video. This is what you do with bad video. Uh, there's you guys still seeing it? Yes, yes, sir. Wow. So that that one is color purple almost. Uh huh. And that one's spotted. Okay. And then you so can what, see how big the attenuate across green and gold can get. Yeah. Wow. A little Chazeroy. All right, we'll walk over here a little bit. We're running out of light. <laughs> Parasana bloomed. Xylanacantha. Mm -hmm. That's lion's mane up there. Agave tight note of lion's mane. And yeah. there's, there's Montana. And more tight notas. Wow. And variegated tight nota. Chris and I. More agaves over there. This is a huge crop. <laughs> So how long have you, how long have you planted them on the ground? So you just do you just keep on adding new ones, or do you, yeah. do you even have the time to rearrange it? This is blue glow. Um, I I I do. What happens is they eventually they bloom out, and when they bloom out, you lose them. So, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, it's a mess of plants here. There's no question. There's too many here. But I have to say that this is just my playground because I. I actually have a full-time job with Altman Plants, and it's a yeah. wonderful, wonderful company and a wonderful, wonderful place. But I have greenhouses full of more of this stuff, so this is just, the, like I said, the tip of the iceberg. Okay. So one of the one of the best questions we had before was about your dumpster. <laughs> yes. Everybody wants to get into my dumpster. Um, do, you, do you also have an agave dumpster? You know what? I ought to name a plant agave dumpster. <laughs> I don't know why I can't get in the feed though. Yeah, we can. We can see you. I know you can see me, but why can't I see you? Um, I think go back to the window. I'll stream you. Yeah. So, Sir Arthur, um, do you have any question for Kelly? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just curious if Adobe is like cold weather or temperatures. 
temperature. Hello, can you hear me? What's the question? Uh, I just like to know if they like cold temperatures. If some they do you, have, some yeah. do and some don't. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Are they in C3 plants or C4 plants? Well, can you repeat but, once, once more? Yeah, um, his question was hey. if agave loves cool temperature. Um, the high mountain ones do. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, how about their metabolism? Is they, do they have the crashulation acid metabolism? I think they're all cam. I don't know them not to be. But ah, okay. but but in terms of uh where you know the concept of agave is they're kind of like people, they're all different, they have different needs and different wants, and uh agaves are, are very different species to species. What is kind of interesting is that some of the characteristics can be spread amongst them. So like if you have, take a very cold tolerant plant and you cross it with a plant that's not so cold tolerant, you end up getting a plant that usually is more cold tolerant, at least than the one species. So if you can go pick up characteristics that you like in the, say, wimpy one, and you combine yeah. it with something that's maybe a little bit boring, um, you might get something that's a little nicer in, in some aspects, a little more cold tolerant in some aspects, and, and that's always a win. I know that with agave attenuata, um, we had a big hard freeze here, I want to say about 10 or 15 years ago, and most of the attenuatas really took a dive, whereas most of the um, um, blue uh, flames, mm -hmm. they were tolerant of the cold. They took about five degrees more cold than the other one. So. Mm -hmm. In terms of, uh... <clears throat> yeah. Okay, and I know we have um, five minutes left here. So for uh, we have another question about tissue culture. So how are the roots from tissue culture agaves? In Hawarthia, the experience is that if you get a TC plant, it's the roots may not survive well in your regular mix. Seedlings are considered considered healthier plants. Is agave the same or do you just reroute them and they are fine? The TC plant, the roots may not survive well in your regular mix. Seedlings are considered healthier plants. All right. Well, there's a, this concept that people have about TC and plants being weaker or having some characteristics. I find that if you, if you don't hit the auxins too hard and you don't get any mutagens and you don't get any mutations, that the plants will be exactly the same as the original plant. So if the original plant is a wimp, then the babies are all going to be wimps too. Yeah. So I, don't, I don't see that. I don't even see their um, generally this thing, oh, well, oh, well, allopolyphilus and tissue culture don't spiral. Well, they do. They do spiral, and they spiral just like the original plant would have. Maybe not as good as another seedling might have, but whatever put was put in is what comes out generally. Now, sometimes you get mutations. When you get mutations, all bets are off. Sometimes the plant's more vigorous. Sometimes it's tetrapoid. Sometimes it's variegated. Sometimes it's wimpier. Sometimes it's, you know, it could be any of those. So when mutations happen, you're talking about a different bag of worms. But when you're talking about TC done right, you, generally it's a great way to do it because we also generally screen for viruses. And so a lot of the plants are indexed and they don't, they don't have viruses and they won't be, be sick. So there's, there's a lot of things that you can control in TC. But uh, garbage in, garbage out. Remember that expression? If you, if yeah. you put a shitty hybrid in, it's going to come out just as shitty as it was. And on the flip side of that, if you put a really good vigorous one in and you do it right, it's going to come out just that way. So okay. I hope that answers. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So last question uh, for Kelly. What part of agave, agaves do pops grow? For a horizontally cut agave, let's say if I remove the grown pops, will it still grow pops again? When will a cut agave stop producing pops? I mean, this is for coring. For coring? Yeah. I, yeah. It generally, as long as it can continue to make sugar, it'll keep making pops. So yeah. you get to the point where there's leaves are all dried up and there's no green part, it's really hard for that plant to come up with any stored sugars to make 
make new leaf grow. On the flip side of that, if you core it, sometimes I do this, I, I core it and I take the biggest of the puff. Um, but if I'm going for variegation, I'll darn sure remove all the ones that aren't variegated and just get rid of them as quick as I can. Because I don't want it to spend energy making non-variegated if I'm trying to get a variegate. On the flip right. side, if I'm clearing it and I'm, it's one that I like and I'm making more and more, I'll at the end leave two or three cups still on there because they're still contributing to the whole health of the plant and it'll continue to make more cups. Um, and there's a tendency for people to wipe out all the cups and just leave like four little tiny leaves that have all the sugars in them. And it, it'll come to a stop and say no more. But even that said, You've probably got five or six or seven out of it. And so you've gone from one to five or six or seven, right? Mm -hmm. So so that's a, a Benny. It's really socket when you you tissue you core plant and somehow through all of it, you end up with one plant, or even worse, the whole thing dies and you have zero. So you went from one to zero. That that really is awful. And that's the the downside of not being experienced with coring and also not having good luck with it. Um, we've all had bad luck. So, um, but it's the exact same reason why you'd want to core plant for your tissue culture. Because if you screw up tissue culture, if you get it infected or your technique is bad or for some reason you didn't get it sterile enough or worse than that, you sterilized it too much and you killed it. Um, if you have one and you kill it, you have one. So that's why you core it. You core it and get five. You put two in tissue culture. If one of them fails, you still got one in tissue. And if both of them fail, you still got three more times. So oh, all right. the time, it's kind of like being in a Las Vegas nightclub. You know, you don't want to bet that the last dollar plus your rent next month. <laughs> you bet money you can afford to lose and put three bucks in your pocket so you can get home and have dinner. Right. Okay. So Kelly, that's right into our um to our mark um i know that you you have to go so uh, do you have any any advice last words uh for our viewers i, I would say to everybody if you're interested in field work and going and seeing these plants in the wild as soon as this coronavirus thing is over get out there and do it because you, you know plants are diminishing and going away from habitats because of land development and road development and uh, all kinds of uses of the land. And, and to see them, it just changes who you are and your very basic chemistry. So if you get a chance to do it and, and you're still ambul ambulatory, do it. Go, go see them. Go see the plants. Nothing like it. It's like going to a live concert. <laughs> Greg, so... So there, so Kelly, thank you so much for your time. Um, we thank are you, actually Kelly. going to we are going to have a, a a second part of this. We'll just uh, take a quick break uh, for that, just to discuss uh, what Arthur have um, for his uh, presentation. But uh, again, Kelly, thank you so much for um, joining us for these two parts. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having thank me, you, Kelly. Uh, I'd like to get to know more of you and also all the people on the list. Thank you for all your good questions. Feel free thank to contact. Yeah, yes, thank yes, you. yes. Thank you, Kelly. So, guys, we are just going to have a break and then we'll be back to you in five minutes. All right. Thank you. Thank you.